Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Francine, and everybody here. Um, I'm a bit of a last minute addition, so um, I kind of feel special because of that. In, in some kind of way. And uh, I'm kind of following on from many other speakers who have uh, discussed their amazing research this weekend. And actually the research I'm looking at stems from discoveries made from crop circles. And it's about, sto I call it Stone Age Survival, and about earth energies and fertility and secrets of the stones. Oh. And um, first of all though, I want to dedicate this to John Michel, who's um, a good friend of mine and also one of my biggest inspirations uh, for any of all this kind of research. And he died actually on St. George's Day this year and uh, we dedicated our conference Megalithomania to him as well. Um, but I just want to read out this quote from his book, uh, The View Over Atlantis, which was his seminal book in the late 60s because I feel it's a very, not only is, it, is a visionary idea at the time, no one had really thought of it like this, and it also sums up much of the research that I do nowadays to do with global ancient sites and earth energies. So a great scientific instrument lies sprawled over the entire surface of the globe. At some period, perhaps it was over 4,000 years ago, almost every corner of the world was visited by a group of men who came with a particular task to accomplish. With the help of some remarkable power by which they could cut and raise enormous blocks of stone, these men erected vast astronomical instruments, circles of erect pillars, pyramids, underground tunnels, cyclopean alignments, whose course from horizon to horizon was marked by stones, mounds, and earthworks. The vast scale of prehistoric engineering is not gen yet generally recognized, John Michel. So then words of John Michel kind of lead into some, some ideas that I've been developing to do with earth energies. And I've been researching this for, uh, I've been dedicated to researching this for two years now and looking at the fertility aspects of earth energies. Now, originally this research was done by the BLT research team in America, uh, and especially John Burke, who wrote the book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. And they came, up with this, they, they came up with this discovery when they went to look at where crop circles had appeared the year before. And they went back to the field a year later to see if any effects had appeared within the crops themselves. And often they noticed where, exactly where the crop circle had been the year before. The crop was now growing much quicker and faster and was, and was more abundant than the rest of the crop in the field. So there'd been some kind of effect that either the construction of the crop circle by the unknown makers of it had stimulated, i.e. an electromagnetic, potentially energy, or the, the design itself had somehow altered the crop structure as well. So there's all these different ideas. But so that initially they thought, well, this is interesting because if a, just a crop circle in a field can increase the growth rate and yield of any type of crop, then this has potentials for use in agricultural um, farming technology. And, um, and it can actually be used as a kind of system of, of technology that's, that's still in use today. So these are some ideas that I've, I've been developing. The first hypothesis is um, that crop circles have helped unlock the great mystery of earth energy, which we'll look, look at how that is the case as we go through this talk. Earth energy, I believe, through my research, was manipulated into energy lines to increase fertility in the landscape, animals, humans, and the crops themselves. Another hypothesis is that the magnetic and electrical effects, which are often what you get with, with the crop circles when they're formed, which has been discussed at this conference as well, that this is an ancient science, and um, it was actually in use within the megalithic sites as well, and not just in the crops, not just a crop circle technology. But it can, it, can, it can help you reach altered states of consciousness. And also, it's linked with the ability of shamanic traveling to other megalithic sites. And in some reports, and some cases that I've, been, that I've found, there's even ideas about time traveling, that, that certain cha ancient megalithic chambers and stone circles are, uh, that people have reported with. But we'll, we'll look at that a bit later. So I'm wondering if crop circles share the same purpose, and they're helping uncover much of an ancient megalithic science. And then hypothesis three, is this ancient technology being revealed for a reason? Perhaps in a post-2012 world, this knowledge may be essential as a survival tool, an awakener, and a direct contact with Gaia. 
because these sites, as we'll see in this tour, these megalithic sites that we're going to look at are actually still working. They still work as a, as a device, uh, which is, could be very important in the coming years. So first of all, we really need to have a look at the, um, <coughs> the magnetic field of the planet before we get into Earth energies, because the magnetic field is constantly at flux. It's constantly moving around. There's still debate exactly what causes it, although an iron-rich core is one suspect. But as we can see in this next slide, um, we can see that it kind of comes out through the North Pole and the South Pole and comes back round again into the center. And this beautiful crop circle is a very good representation of how it works. But these field lines, during the, uh, when the sun rises, the field lines in the morning increase in strength and tightness and they speed across the landscape and move through different geology in, in different ways, depending on actually the type of geology it's moving through, whether it may be a conductive uh, geology or a less conductive geology. And often these, technically they're magnetic lines, often have high electric charge, depending on the media they move through. This just shows you the basic uh, the magnetic flow lines of the planet and just shows you the basics of uh, how that functions. But when we, get, when we apply this kind of, these idea of these field lines, or sometimes they're called telluric lines, they're also called lines of force, there's lots of different names for them. If they're applied to the ancient sites, we find lots and lots of uh, strange phenomena occurs. For instance here, this is um, a dolmen in New York State in a place called North Salem. It's a huge dome and it's 90 tons. Um, it's got four or five granite quartz blocks here. And you can see these orbs in the photo as well. And officially, um, on the sign, as you go there, it says it was a glacial erratic that landed there um, on these four blocks. Um, and actually, the, because it came from over 30 miles away. So even in North America, in prehistoric times, they were lugging 90 ton stones around. Uh, and making these dolmens. Here, this is a photograph taken on the top of the uh, Lost World Pyramid in Tikal. It's one of the, the much older pyramids there. We have the two classic pyramids, uh, which everyone has seen, uh, with the sort of more pointy tops on them. But this one here is at least 800 years older than the famous ones there. And again, we, we get, in the mornings, you get all these different orb photography. Um, these orbs keep occurring. This photo here, this was taken at a rock chamber, again, in New York State. And you can see this plasma band that was photographed here by John Burke. Again, this was, again, first thing in the morning. This is the book they, um, they wrote, John Burke and Kaj Halberg, which looks at this science. So fundamentally, what we're really seeing here, what we're going to explore in this talk, is the idea that the ancients were working with a fertility technology but also that same energy that they're dealing with and, and they've been researching and uh, exploring is actually in increases altered states of consciousness within the human being and can have dramatic effects on various people. And, um, and you can see how well it affected um, Jeff and I in this next photo. And you can, you can see all these orbs occurring and we're not sure, um, oh, oops a daisy. We're not sure where they came from because we weren't technically at a sacred site, but um, you never know. And here's my, this is when I visited Balance Rock in New York State. You can see this great orb here and a few others scattered around as well. And this is um, some research that was done and they found that these dolmens, especially they found this in North America and, and at many other sites as well, that they're built upon a huge ma magnetic anomaly that's naturally within the land itself. They're built on a negative, it's a negative magnetic anomaly where the magnetic magnetism of that particular area drops dramatically. And that, they think, is what causes this electric charge. Because when magnetism drops, you often get electric charge. And, um, and this is what these orbs potentially are, according to these researchers. The other thing with these types of stone, if you're looking at quartz or granite rocks, we find that we have the piezoelectrical effect as well. And when they move slightly, or just often just the weight, the weight of a very heavy rock on top of another can cause a piezoelectrical effect. And these can build, and stones can build up charge and then release them at a certain time. And this is basically one of the fundamentals of um, uh, computers and watches. It's all, they're all uh, programmed and timed to release things at certain, uh, in certain sequences. 
So again, we think this technology may have been applied in ancient times with these sites. They were actually building up this charge through these different energies forming through the earth and manipulating it and then releasing it for various purposes. And you can see in this next photo that sometimes, this is actually in Brittany, that sometimes these stones are just mainly quartz. I mean, this one here is virtually pure quartz. And so are some of these. And this one here is another site quite nearby. And they're all placed in certain alignments and certain curves. And when you douse there, you can actually s easily see that the earth energy is following these stones. And actually, th there's some connection there. This, again, is the, a chamber in New York State. This is a place called Kent Cliffs. This image here, you can see the orbs again, just inside the chamber. Now, technically, there's probably something like 200 of these chambers in New England, in the whole New England northeast area of America. And the archaeologists claim, and still claim, that they're colonial root cellars. And they were just used to store vegetables uh, by the English and the Europeans who went there a few hundred years ago. However, some of the rocks they're using, these lintels, are up to 40 tons. And I can't imagine any family would be lugging 40 ton rocks around just to store their vegetables. But they stick by this. They really stick by this claim. And they, haven't, they won't change this. And it's, it's, it's quite, um, become, become quite detrimental to the sites themselves. Because some of these sites uh, are right next to roads, and developers want to expand, expand the roads uh, and, and build you know, new businesses and housing estates and so forth. And these, these chambers get demolished because the archaeologists aren't sort of making it clear what they are. They're not researching it properly. Because carbon dating of many of these sites has dated these back to 4,000 years ago, and no one has any idea who built them. But again, these are perfect examples of this fertility technology. And the evidence is with these orbs that keep appearing. I mean, this again, this one here was taken with a, just a standard camera. It wasn't a digital camera, if anyone's got any questions about the fact that digital cameras seem to capture them only. Here you can see the magnetic uh, contour lines that flow through the area around this chamber. And uh, you can see how they build up and circle here right at the entrance of this chamber. And again, as with the, the balanced rock, the, the large dolmen we saw in the previous image, here is a huge negative magnetic anomaly right in the doorway. And this is exactly where this orb is photographed. And what they did, they then developed these ideas and thought, well, if there's some kind of electric charge there, and we saw what happened with the crop circle the following year after it, it had actually appeared, they thought, well, let's place some seeds in these chambers and see what happens to these seeds, like, like they saw initially in the crop circle. And they did this, and they, they had to experiment on the times and times of day and how long they put them in these chambers for. But what they kept coming out with is if they placed them in there for roughly between an hour and two hours, often in the morning where their electric volt voltometers and magnetometers gave the highest readings, when they placed them in at that time, and then they went to plant the seeds, and then they planted them next to some controls which weren't actually uh, placed in the chamber, huge, huge results w would occur to do with yields and quality of the crop. This is, this is just uh, another oil photograph in, in yet another chamber in New England. Like, this kept happening at all the different sites uh, we visited. And this shows you how um, the energies move, uh, have been discovered, that move through Stonehenge. This is the main entrance to Stonehenge here. And the white area shows where electric current or, tel or these telluric energies have been moving through the ground. And they've, they've, you can see how they've gone around the edge and haven't gone through the ditch or the henge, but have actually gone only through the entrance where there's a flat surface. This is because these type of earth energies only move through the surface and they only go about two or three feet below the ground. So if you, if you dig a, you know, a henge or a ditch, these telluric energies hit that ditch and then follow it round until they find the flat surface again and then come into the site. So it seems that potentially these henges could have been used to direct and manipulate these earth energies uh, and control them and put them into certain places within the structure. You can see this here. This is just the path, so you can just ignore that. They also found in Stonehenge, there were um, some early archaeological reports. They found little um, holes, sort of bowls, that were cut into the ground. 
and they found lots of burnt seeds and grains and other things in there, suggesting that originally they thought they were just offerings being made to the dead, which is the kind of thing um, a lot of the archaeologists say when they sort of find anything. Um, but what they found was that these, these particular spots where they placed these seeds were also the place where there was the highest charge and that was recorded. And so they could have been used again for this fertility technology to charge up the seeds. A similar thing was discovered at Avebury as well. The same principles really at work because Avebury is known as a kind of Beltane um, sort of ritual center according to mm, traditions and certain authors. And obviously we have the Michael and Mary energies that go directly along the avenues and uh, through the Avebury circle itself. But what John Burke and his team discovered was that all the, all the stones in the avenues were all aligned magnetically to one another. Now, this is like the north and south magnetic poles of the rock as it forms in the earth over thousands or millions of years. Um, to, for these people who built Avebury to know this and place them perfectly in line with, magnetically in line with each other is a, is a masterpiece in itself because it's really difficult to do that, especially if you don't have compasses or technology to read this kind of thing. So you get this going down the avenues, but then when you get into the circle, the main huge circle, which has roughly 99 stones, they found that all the stones were actually magnetically aligned going around in the circle. So it was like it was directing, the, it would be able to direct somehow the energy around the circle and through the avenues themselves. Now this was just an anomaly, they haven't really followed this up, and. They, they, they don't really know what to make of this, but the fact is we, we have the Michael and Mary energy lines going through the same, in the, following the same route, then there may be a connection there, which we'll have a look at shortly. There's magnetic anomalies all over the world. Um, when I went to Bolivia, uh, I went to Tiwanaku and, um, and Peru and uh, found that this was the Acapana pyramid, and this is one of the huge pyramids at Tiwanaku, which is basically They've only really been excavating it properly recently, so that you can't really see much here. But there's this huge area here which you're not allowed in anymore. And th these are lines, you can't really see this, but these are lines of megaliths going along here. This was like, um, like a sort of door. And in this area here is a huge magnetic field. And no one knows wh why, why it's there or, or how it got there or if it's been manipulated or if it's natural. But the fact is, it's right on top of the main pyramid at Tiwanaku, and it's not mentioned in any other books about the importance of this. You go in there with a compass, and, and, and it just starts spinning one way, then it spins the other. It, it really do doesn't know where it is. So there's this really unusual occurrence we keep finding at all these ancient sites around the world. And they were manipulating and working with magnetism and electric charge. This was also noted by um, uh, Callahan, who uh, did some excellent research. Uh, on the round towers of Ireland, <coughs> excuse me, and he concluded that because they were made of paramagnetic stone, that they were they were like attracting kind of energy down not only from the earth but from the cosmos and spreading it through the landscape, and um, that w when the towers were placed in diamagnetic or oppositely magnetic areas, um, it would it would increase the quality of the crops in the field. Uh, all the, the animals will stay healthy. He believed it even at healing purposes as well. And that actually these towers were designed and, 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 and built for this purpose to actually enhance the landscape, enhance the energies there and enhance ourselves within that. And uh, according to the head of the International Institute of Biophysics, uh, I'll just read this quote. Professor Callahan's discovery concerning the Irish round towers is one of the most important discos discoveries of the century. The low energy implications for our health, well-being, and nutrition are far-reaching. So we see that his work has not really been noticed or taken up by many people, but is now coming back with this new application and discoveries through the crop circles and, the, and how it, it's also similar with the ancient megalithic sites around the planet. We can see that it now has some clout. He also noticed this as well. When you line up the round towers throughout Ireland, they actually form, um, they actually just map the stars, basically, really precisely. This has been debated as a coincidence by you know, most people, but it's just worth noting because it seems they may have been trying to draw energy down from the cosmos. It may have been their ancient religion. So these, show, these are just some examples that um, Burke and others were working with um, in, in, in America and also in Guatemala. This is the, 
they, 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 they tried to find the oldest crops they could that they think maybe were being used by the people who built these actual sites. And uh, this example here is some blue corn, which they placed in uh, the rock chamber that uh, I showed you earlier in Kent Cliff, New York State. And they placed it in there for 75 minutes, then went to grow it. And then next to that, they grew some uh, controls, which hadn't been in the chamber. And this is the difference in yield they got. You can see a three-fold increase immediately. And this happened every single time they did their tests at, at sites all around the world. And uh, the results were astonished, astonished them because not only did they grow quick, uh, they, they get more yield, they grew much faster, became, often became frost resistant, and the seeds would last for many, many years longer. So we're looking at a kind of survival and fertility technology that was uh, worked with by the ancients. These are the ones that were placed on top of the Lost World Pyramid at Tikal. And you can see the difference. Th these are the ones on the pyramid, obviously. And these are the controls. And some of them don't even sprout whereas all of these sprouted pretty much. And dolmens seem to be one of the best sort of devices for this because they, they kind of trap the energy and they, they allow the charge over time to build up in there. And it seems somehow the ancients could then release this charge. And the thing with dolmens is that you actually get them all over the world. Uh, we've already seen them in North America. We know they're in Britain, all over Britain. You get them in France, um, also in Tunisia, in Jordan. You also get them, I just got a phone call the other day from a, a friend of mine who was in Korea and he, say, he, he rang me up out of the blue, he never rings me and he just said, do you realize Hugh that there's 19,000 dolmens in Korea? And I was like, what? I just, I, so that just gives you an example of the kind of magnitude of megalithic sites we have on this planet. If Korea alone has 19,000 of them, they must have cottoned onto this. And why, they wouldn't build them just for fun. So it seems this may have traveled worldwide, this fertility technology, because it really is about surviving. You know, it really is about kind of working with these energies for survival purposes, something that we seem to have lost because we're so dependent on these sort of um, metal kind of technologies. There's also the actual type of rock. Um, I find very interesting because I've, I've studied nutrition and, and looked into mineral nutrition especially. I found that certain types of rock, like especially basalt rock, is actually a really useful nutritional supplement. And, uh, and, and it's believed now that the ancients may have been using the powder from when they were actually uh, quarrying for these ancient sites as a, a nutritional aid. But also, because it's paramagnetic, it has certain qualities and effects, which some of them uh, are listed here. For example, this one is, is quite an interesting one. In some cases, not all cases, okay, I can, no guarantees here, it returned hair color from gray back to its original color because of the, the sheer amount of nutrients that we're missing, that missing in our diet that is, can be returned just through using a certain type of rock dust. And you can literally just pow get this powdered up precise, really carefully and you can actually drink it. Or you can just put it on your, you know, on your sort of, um, uh, in your garden. It also reduces radioactive comp components in the body, soil improvement and increased plant growth because it's got this paramagnetic nature. It also helps, um, feed nutrients back into the, the soil and the crops themselves because it attracts microbes. All the m nutrients and the minerals in the rock, if you get something like 72 minerals in basalt, uh, they become bioavailable again through the plant. It also holds off unwanted radio waves and other electromagnetic kind of smog. As we know, it affects natural telluric currents and that acts as acupuncture points on the earth to reduce toxic effects, like sort of geopathic stress and, and other, th other things. And because it's paramagnetic, um, it kind of has this sort of positively healing and sort of effective quality about it, which is uh, something that the megaliths obviously have themselves as well. They found through tests um, in Australia, uh, there's a woman called Alana Moore. She was uh, doing a lot of research there for about 15 years. And they were testing, like putting lots of like paramagnetic rock all over the farms. In one case, they got these tiny little stone circles, just a couple of feet wide, with brick-sized rocks. Placed them all over the farm, and within, I think by the end of the summer, it had affected all the telluric energies over the entire farm. And everything started growing quicker, and all the yields started increasing just by doing that. So on a larger scale, we can see that perhaps the ancient megalithic sites, stone circles, etc., may have been part of a much larger system of that 
to maintain this fertility and to maintain this kind of high level of energy throughout the landscape. Because we know uh, through, through dowsing and other disciplines that energy lines do go between ancient sites. They're not just um, stuck just in the local vicinity. They stretch for miles, even hundreds of miles, all around the world in some cases. So when we look at um, fertility, there's lots of symbols uh, you can see. Oh, oh, I don't know how he got there. Yeah, but this is the classic kind of fertility symbol, uh, as you can see. Um, I don't know how he got there. He must have just appeared out of the blue. But um, but we get this in lots of different places. There's a legend. If you go and hang out there, so you can, you'll easily get pregnant. I, I can't think how or why that could happen. But we get similar legends throughout the world, especially in Britain, you know, um, to do with these fertility. And, and w when you start looking at the modern scientific sort of discoveries about this, we start to get some real understanding that this isn't just random folklore. This is actually serious kind of ancient knowledge coming forth. So I really got a real strong sense that the importance of these, of these legends is to record them and keep, keep them sort of documented. So this is Men and Tol in um, Cornwall and this is just uh, this guy Ian Cook went around all the locals and, and gathered loads of folklore and legends and came, and, and came up with this one so this was for young women in particular it was considered to be helping have an easier childbirth and to cure infertility as well as promote an abundance of crops and cattle so we're seeing all the many of the different aspects just in this one piece of folklore a similar Cornish uh, stone, this, the Tolvan stone, is said that if a person passes through it, it ensures fertility and can heal sick infants. So again, we, we keep finding this throughout. Uh, when I went to Brittany, um, there's lots and lots of the same kind of stories there. I mean, we've got these two stones right near each other, just within about 50 yards of one another. This is obviously the sort of phallic stone. But this stone here really interested me because um, it's, it looks like a pregnant belly. It really does, and it's quite, it's quite large. And when the shadow of that stone is cast on Beltane, it actually touches that. It kind of goes along this sort of now overgrown avenue. But a guy called Howard Crowhurst has been researching this uh, and documenting this. And that the shadow of that goes to that and touches the pregnant belly on Beltane. So again, we're seeing the same kind of symbolism that's still available for those that actually observe these phenomena, these celestial phenomena. So we're getting this bridge between this fertility knowledge, uh, archaeoastronomy now, because of this, this kind of system that we're seeing, and, um, and the idea these are an actual kind of science that was being worked with by the ancient peoples. This is, um, yeah, excuse my stupid pose there. This is uh, a dolmen just outside the, the, the town of Karnak. And again, there's legends associated with this one as well, that if uh, a girl raises her skirt at the dolmen, it will help her find a partner or guarantee a healthy pregnancy. I, I was on that. I was just trying to break that cross off. I couldn't do, do it. Uh, but... So basically, we're seeing the same kind of principles. Again, it may seem like a sort of silly piece of folklore, but when I, when you, when I doused this site, it was a very strong earth energy system there. There was like two or three earth energy lines crossing through the main dolmen. And obviously, it's, um, I think it's uh, granite as well. Some of it was granite. So it had this piezoelectrical effect. I didn't have any equipment to test if it was uh, on a magnetic anomaly or anything, mind you. So again, <coughs> this is on uh, the Scilly Isles. Uh, and this has just been noted by Paul Devereux in his book Places of Power that it's been noted in the ciliars and doubtless elsewhere that bulbs planted near large granite boulders flower early. Presumably radiation from the rock is somehow encouraging their development. So again, just another example that even granite just placed in a garden can encourage uh, the growth of bulbs and different plants. So we're going to move on to some other bits and pieces of the, the talk here. But this is a good, good quote from Paul Devereux, which leads into the next section. I'll read it to you. The forces of the natural world were used, such as the promotion of fertility and for healing. But the overriding purpose was the need to have gateways through which contact with spirit could be achieved. In the ancient world, there were certain people who knew how to work with the physical world in order to create access to the spiritual so as well as having these qualities of fertility and, and other 
such um, sciences, there's a whole other dimension to this. It's to do with the shamanic aspect and how, whether it was accidental, you know, what came first? Did they, just, did they work with these energy for fertility purposes? Or did they know that if they manipulate these energies, you can get an altered state of consciousness? This is um, actually the work of Stefan Cardano, which uh, was mentioned earlier as well. He, he came over to um, England late last year and we, we traveled around many of the sites around Cambridgeshire doing some testing. But he's done, again, some remarkable research on the Hartman and Curry grids and, and, and other energy systems. And he believes that there's a direct effect uh, of consciousness. And one of the things he noticed, which is similar um, to the research we saw earlier uh, to do with crop circles, is that the Hartman and Curry grids around certain sacred sites uh, become a neutral space. And there's no actual... Um, energy system there, so they become like a pure neutral space for them to be worked with by the shamans or whomever to do their, do their work without getting interfered with by outside radiations. And this is just how he sees the, the, the energy system of this particular dolmen and how it's, there's a spiral effect and also radiating effect as well. And there's lots, he, he put all his equipment over and did some amazing research uh, to back this up. And it's just a picture in my book, Earth Grids, um, just to sort of demonstrate the size and shape of these particular Hartman and Curry grids and the effect they have. Um, again, there's, they, have, they can have positive and negative effects. And I must just make it clear here for a minute that the, the, the science of the Earth energies we've been discussing already are quite different to the Hartman and Curry grids, but there's obviously an overlap because they're all working together on the surface of the planet. So <coughs> with the Hartman and Curry grids, have them going at certain angles, they kind of crisscross at certain points. Um, but meg megaliths are known to enhance the radioactive effects of if there's a crossing point there. This was covered in detail by Blanche Mertz in the book Points of Cosmic Energy. And uh, you can see sometimes if there's a negative line, vegetation can actually get damaged. But on the, in the other way, if there's a positive effect, then vegetation can be improved and increased. But also, it can, you can le it can be quite detrimental if you're sleeping on a negative crossing point. You've really got to check out for this, where the geomancers and the geobiologists come in. There's also a connection with the elemental beings, which is something that Stefan Cardano and my good friend Sean Kerwin work with quite intensively when they, they work on geomancy and, and, on, and sort of working on people's houses, and how there's all these different life forms working on different levels of energy and grids. This is just some um, sort of um, psychic drawings that friends of Stefan Cardano were working with and how often if you start communicating with these beings, you, actually get, you can actually get better results and to do with the, uh, manipulating these earth energies for p positive and different purposes. And also, when you, one of the things that keeps coming up in this research is the fact that uh, these orbs, they think the ancients observed these orbs or these balls of light and saw them as something completely different, which is where the whole legends and stories of the fairies and the elves and the sprites and the willow the wisps come in. And this is often seen, we see these in crop circles, but these, these have been reported for literally hundreds of years, even thousands. There's some very ancient reports of this, and they show kind of intelligence, these lights moving through the landscape. They appear often at certain sites over and over and over again. And this is what some people believe is why the ancient sites were built where they were, because they were actually working, they were marking where this phenomena kept happening. And if you get the right, again, if we go back to the, the geology, if you get the right type of geology where two different geologies meet and the earth energies are moving through it in a certain way, this is where you get really altered states of consciousness and you can have a dramatic effect on the psyche. This is being recorded over and over again as well. And so if you're seeing these orbs of light and you're having this altered state of consciousness occur, then you're going to see that then perhaps as sort of elemental beings and sort of go into some kind of intelligent communication with them. And then I believe as well as Gary King pointed out that the ancients were a, a psychedelic culture. I really believe they were working with the local psychotropic plants that were available to them, or the mushrooms, especially in Britain. And this was part of their cultural kind of life. We've obviously moved away from that, and we've gone into a much more material world over the last uh, couple of hundred years. But I think this is one thing that's missing from our culture. And I think 
the idea of working with these different psychedelics is actually a very important aspect of understanding how the ancients were working with these subtle energies and working with these elemental beings because it's, 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 much, it's hard to see it from, a really clear, you know, from this kind of perspective. But with the, mini, with the, the subtle you know, effects of psychedelics, it's going to be a whole different world. And they really aren't seen, they, they weren't seen as drugs back then. I really assume that was the case. Anyway, talking of uh, working with um, the mind, Serena Roney Dougal and other researchers have actually found that you can actually just by using the power of the mind, you can affect seed growth and seed enhancement. It's just incidental to the research. Um, in parapsychology, there's a classic healing experiment in which seeds are stressed and then randomly assigned to either a healing or a control group. Several of these studies have found that there is a greater germination rate and growth in the healed group. The enhanced group of lettuces achieves significantly greater growth and net weights, as well as significantly less slug and fungal damage that would be expected by chance. These combine to produce a substantial total yield for the enhancement group, fully 10% more crop by weight than any other group for the season. Again, there's even this connection with the mind that you can manipulate and work to enhance fertility within uh, different crops. This is some absolutely remarkable research that was done, has been done by the Rus many Russian scientists and, and, and also in other parts of Eastern Europe. Well, they built these pyramids based upon the golden section over the last uh, 20 years or so. And um, they've just done te they built them just to test certain different aspects of the, this whole idea of how pyramids have certain power. So they used the same principles as the Great Pyramid but designed them slightly differently to work more with the golden section ratios and uh, came up with these amazing results. They found, for example, that water would not freeze when placed inside the pyramid, even at sub-zero temperatures. Uh, also, an incre increased electrical resistivity of carbon and silicon increased the strength of concrete. But um, one of the things that got me was 20 seed types that they, they, they tested within the pyramids. Uh, found that there was a 20 to 100% growth increase in the crops. So, and there's a four-fold increase in yield in the surrounding wheat fields as well and granite placed inside the chamber became charged just by being inside the pyramid and they could, they, they could then go and place this around different parts of the farms and that would stimulate the energies within the area itself. And this bit here I think is the most important that an extinct, f extinct flower has returned after 20 years of being extinct. So from out of nowhere somehow it, it brought back these, these certain types of flower so again, we're seeing that just by placing these things in the landscape, they can have an amazingly powerful effect. And obviously, we see that with the Great Pyramid in Egypt. This is one of the fundamentals of this, really. Um, this is the work of Christopher Dunn, who um, I met recently to dis discuss certain aspects of this. And uh, he really believes he's that the, the pyramid worked as a sort of energy system for the planet. It was actually built in harmony with the size of the planet, a perfect proportional uh, relationship to the top, the top half of the Earth, and believes that he's kind of back-engineered the pyramid to try and work out what exactly what it was used for. He's a 25 years experienced engineer, and he came to the basic conclusion that it, it works by absorbing seismic energy from the Earth itself therefore reducing earthquakes and possibly even volcanoes around the planet and was able to then share that energy out through certain means uh, for different purposes. One of them he believes was electricity. He, was, he is absolutely convinced that they were working with electricity and they had actual power tools to cut and move some of these stones. This is the technical side of how he kind of worked this out and how he believes the pyramid actually works. And again, we, we're hitting lots of points of this fertility technology here. So you have to mechanically couple the pyramid with the Earth. This is uh, by just the sheer size of it. it has to be in direct proportion. And um, even the weight of it, they think, is a harmonic of the Earth. Then you initiate oscillation to prime the stones in the pyramid. And then you, you get it to, to vibrate in sympathy with the Earth. And this is where the, the granite beams come in above the king's chamber that he thinks that they were, they were designed specifically so they would move, just move a fraction naturally on their own just by wobbling. And this would create a piezoelectrical effect. And then the granite, which is, you know, 55% quartz, 
acts as a transducer by alternating compression, which is the sort of wobbling effect. And then he believes that there's a hydrogen fuel, that hydrogen fueled the power plant and enabled energy to be transferred to the outside. I'm not, this is, this is to, the un, to a non-engineer like myself, this does sound a bit odd, but he's absolutely, he believes he's really cracked that it was used as an energy device and it was used to work all, all around the grid, not just in Egypt itself. That it would actually send energy around, around the entire planet. And it could do because it was so in harmony with the planet. It was a bit like the work that Tesla was doing um, earlier last century, where he was able to sort of have a whole electricity system that actually went through the Earth, didn't affect anyone negatively, but was able to power the entire planet for free. So it's a similar system that he believes was in place um, in antiquity. And this is just a summary of um, what he was, um, his research. Because it's actually right in the center of the world's land mass, if you, the Great Pyramid, if you take land in any direction from there, there's more land mass in, in each direction than from any other point on the planet. So it's like the gravitational kind of like center point of the planet. There's also been some dis discoveries up in um, Scotland and um, Ireland and other places where they find these strange kind of um, iron, stone and granite spheres and no one really knows what they're for. But tests have been done on them, and they, they, they're very, one of them is very magnetic, paramagnetic, and the other one is diamagnetic, and they were found together. So they think there's some use of them. They're kind of handheld size as well. There may have been some use of them to manipulate the, the different energies in these ancient sites, either as they were constructing them or for, for other purposes unknown. And we find all these other uh, sort of stone spheres as well that have been discovered throughout England, Ireland, Scotland, and some other parts of Northern Europe. Literally hundreds of these have been discovered. They're all handheld size again. And uh, you can see that they actually form the different platonic solids, the five different platonic solids. And some of them are combinations of the platonic solids and other amazing spherical geometries. And these were dated to the same period as uh, the megalithic sites in Scotland. So we're looking at about 3000 BC, at least. And this one here is particularly beautiful. You can just see the, the beautiful sort of spiral carving on it, similar to what we see at Newgrange. Now, Keith Critchlow did a lot of research on these and um, believed that they weren't hunting projectiles, as um, the archaeologists believed. He believed they had some other purpose, and they were for the analysis of spherically determined systems of geometry. And so he's suggesting that even in prehistoric times, they were working with advanced spherical geometry and astronomy and mathematics. And he, he concluded, he brought all the different geometries that he discovered uh, throughout the different museums together and put them into a coherent kind of system. And he came up with this, this here. And this, this really got me because um, this is an exact replica of the Earth grid, the classic Earth grid system. And this made me think, well, perhaps with the relationship to the ancient sites, that this system of Earth energy that we've seen all around the planet, there is a connection there between all the sites across the entire surface of the globe, and not just in England, perhaps. And that the, 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 the fertility and sort of consciousness system that they were working with was a global phenomenon, and they were working with it all around the planet. And we've already seen a little bit about the grid in uh, Bradfield's talk. And this is just the classic, um, the classic sort of Becker and Hagen's version of the grid. And it just shows you some interesting, this, this, there's some interesting points here. This is um, the Bermuda Triangle area. This is, you can see in South America how the land mass kind of forms around that particular point. And here, the Gulf of Carpentaria in um, Australia. There's a point right in that huge bay. Obviously, we've got one in Britain here, up in northern Scotland. We've got, um, Easter Island and Hawaii are other points, and various other different aspects. Like this is all covered quite in detail in the, my book about earth grids. But um, you can see here as well that, um, in fact, I'll just look on the next picture. Because um, the grid does almost line up with the Michael line that goes through southern England. Um, most of you, I guess, know about this. We're kind of uh, around here at the moment, aren't we? And we have the Michael Mary lines very nearby, just um, going through the, the church up on that little hill there, I think, Merlin's Mound. 
But this interests me when I saw this because I was looking at, initially I was looking at earth grids, but then the relationship with this fertility technology, I thought, well, perhaps it is a global phenomenon and this fertility energies are actually move around the entire planet. And when I first saw this image many years ago when I read this book, um, The Sun and the Serpent, I immediately thought that this must be a global phenomenon. This can't just be a line, some lines that stretch through England here. And Hamish Miller said that he has found them continuing up into St. Petersburg in Russia. And I thought, well, this is, where do they go here then? Where's the rest of it? And is there any connection with other sites that have similar legends and stories around the planet? But initially, I wanted to look at my hometown um, of near Cambridge because the Mary Line goes right through uh, this place called Wandleberry, which is this ancient circular earthwork. And there's some very powerful tumulus here and Telegraph Clump and other sites in the area. And this is where the angel crop formation appeared in 2001, uh, just in this field here, just along this particular earth energy current, the Mary Line. One of the things about this as well, which kind of intrigued me, is that this particular crop circle moved the Mary line about 100 yards away from its original course. Because we doused this before, um, like a year or two before, we doused exactly where the Mary line went through Wandleberry. We got a precise map of it. And then when this angel crop formation turned up, we, we went, up, went to check it again. And originally it kind of went like this. And then this angel formation just pulled it off course. And then it went back again to its original course. So that kind of interested me. I mean, that sh to me, that sh showed me a direct interaction with earth energies and crop circles, which I hadn't really seen before. Um, and then I, I noticed again in the Son of the Serpent book that they point out that in 1988, that every single crop circle that appeared that summer, and there weren't so many about then, I understand, every crop circle that appeared that summer was actually on the Mary line only. There was no other crop circles in any other part of uh, Wiltshire. So that kind of interested me as well. And a couple of weeks before this one appeared, we had this one, the big 666 footer. I don't know if any of you uh, remember that. And we've got a very powerful, this tumulus here is remarkably powerful. And uh, there are lots of legends and stories and folklore associated with this whole kind of uh, landscape here. But this tumulus is just an example of the way a, a tumulus could work. And uh, there's it's a place called uh, Wormwood Hill, but it's also got another name which goes much further back called the Dragon's Barrow. And uh, even though the local archaeologists are, are kind of debate this with constantly, they think it's a natural hill. But you go up there and you, you, you sit there for long enough and you, you can tell there's something going on there. It's like a great big organ generator and it really is rather powerful. And this is just a quote from Andrew Collins' book, The Circle Makers, about Wormwood Hill. And it's a really interesting example that I feel works on many different sites. And many of the effects people have on these energy, si energy sites are actually the same as this. I'll just read this out to you. I think this is quite an important, it kind of covers a lot of different um, ideas. This was about basically a guy, um, Bill Eden, an investigator, who went up to the hill to kind of check out the energies there and see if he could psychically pick up anything. So he could clearly see it, the hill, engulfed by swirling bands of lights, unseen by his colleague. Ignoring this, he stepped onto the mound amid the vibrant colored light and instantly sustained a powerful headache, an intense pressure on his chest and head, a bitter metallic taste, nausea and dizziness. With this came the sound of a deep tonal note that resonated from the ground and rose in pitch the higher he climbed. Even more curious was the disconcerting sensation that he was about to leave his physical body through the process known as astral projection. He also saw with his psychic eyes priestly figures in saffron colored robes approaching the site in ceremonial fashion. So we see that just by standing on a tumulus that can happen. Um, so there's a lot to consider there. But it's also that these are similar effects to what people get in the crop circles as well. I mean, we probably, you probably know this as avid crop circle explorers. But you get the same kind of thing. And also you get this obviously at the ancient sites as well. And this again is linked to the magnetic qualities of the geology and how the earth energies move through that. And, uh, and, and, and there's an idea that with Silbury Hill and other sites, they're built like huge orgone generators to actually build up energy and then spread it out through the landscape. 
because anything that's got layers of organic and non-organic materials just in several layers above it will build up energy within inside it and if you then have a chamber within that which often some of these places do then it builds up within the chamber and with the correct technology you can use um, to get you can actually time when the energy will come out so there's lots of different aspects here and I think the all going one is particularly interesting so as it's a crop circle conference, I thought I'd better to get some crop circles in quickly. But this is just the one that appeared in Cambridge. I don't know if any of you n knew about this particular one. But um, Charles Mallet went down to Cambridge to sort of measure this and check it out. And it originally appeared without this bit here. It just had this big circle and that one in the middle. And then a few days later, this appeared, which is rather beautiful maze design. And then after that, this, that bit there, that bit I think, and this bit here appeared. And then so obviously loads of us went into the crop circle for several nights waiting for the next two bits to appear. <laughs> and then they didn't, so we were gutted. But, but a few days later, well about two weeks later, uh, we had the, this wonderful design appear um, on the 25th of July 2001, the classic angel design which is um, that's quite a magical effect on me when I visited this. And so we had, the, we had the Mary line, we had it coming in like this, from this angle here. Sorry, it was like this rather. Originally it was over here somewhere. And the Mary line kind of came in like that. Did a little dance just to the head of the angel above it there. A little vortex or something. And then went back to its original, uh, original course. So, very unusual interaction between crop circles and earth energies. And I'd like to, you know, chat with anyone afterwards who's had anything similar uh, in, their, in their research or experience. And just to pick up the Cambridge landscape, here's some other ones that appeared in that area, if any of you are down that way. These are ones that appeared in Girton. Uh, sorry, these two here appeared in Girton, which is just north of Cambridge. Uh, obviously, the Bythorn Mandala from 1993. Um, and the classic Mandelbrot design from <coughs> 1991. Now, there's many stories associated with this one. Uh, there were there was UFOs were seen and lights were hovering over the night sky the night before it appeared. Um, lots of strange stories. And then, it actually, um, even after it appeared, a few weeks after, people went in there and took photos and got lots of anomalies, sort of dark sort of blotches in their camera lens. Again, this is, um, I think this is in Andrew Collins' book, The Circle Makers. And just nearby, we have the Mowing Devil in Hertfordshire, which is um, not that far from Cambridge. And again, this had light phenomena associated with it. There's the, the, the classic woodcut and the, and the story that originally came out. It talks about fiery kind of lights appearing in the field that night. And then when they went to check it out, this, what, they, what they believe was a crop circle appeared through certain interpretation. Anyway, just wanted to bit of a Cambridge crop circle excursion then. So back to the, the Michael and Mary lines, because this is basically where Wandlebury is up here, up this area. And we're down here somewhere. But so with this idea that this is a global current kind of intrigued me. And a few, a few years after this, and I kept questioning, well, where's the rest of it? I came across this map by a guy called Robert Kuhn. Um, and this is what's called the planetary rainbow serpent map or uh, with the planetary chakra system on it. I'm sure most of you have seen this probably. And this is the, another crop circle that appeared actually right on the Mary line, which is basically the ex this extension, the Michael and Mary line here. This is what Robert Kuhn calls the female great current. And this is the, what he calls the plume serpent. So we have the rainbow, ser we have the rainbow serpent the female current, and the plumed serpent, the male current, here. And this is where they kind of supposedly cross, here and here, the Lake Titicaca. Um, and the whole chakra system is very interesting. I, I don't really have time to go into it now, but if you want to check it out, you can go to rainbowserpent.co.uk. A friend of mine, Tor Webster, has uh, been uh, writing a film about this. And these are just, uh, for those that are interested, these are just sort of the main points on that particular system. Specifically, Glastonbury is interesting in this whole, the whole Glastonbury Shaftesbury area because it's two of them. Look, the heart chakra and the third eye chakra. It's a little bit greedy, if you ask me, but never mind. 
So I, I followed this line down to Lake Titicaca in Peru, and I kind of wanted to not follow it because I, I can't swim that far. But I, I flew down to Lake Titicaca in Peru and actually wanted to check out if there is a connection, uh, if there is any energy lines, as Robert Kuhn pointed out in his research, if they do actually cross there. Um, I'll just show you this picture first. So this is kind of the island of the sun in the middle of Lake Titicaca. And I quickly found that you know, if, you draw, if you do a straight line, extension of the St. Michael line around the world, it does go right through the center of uh, the island of the sun, which I thought was quite interesting and gave it some clout. So I went there and I went to the northern part of the island first and came across this kind of dolmen figure um, with a great, I don't know if you can see this, but it's like a great big frog effigy behind it. You have to probably squint your eyes or perhaps. But this is what the Inca, some Inca people who live around the lake, they, they describe this as the great Inca effigy. And underneath here, where lots of offerings are being made. And, and this stone here, underneath, this big white looking stone, actually is huge. It goes kind of like that. And they don't think it's natural to this area. So how they got that there, I don't know. And then we have a granite kind of mini dolmen on top of it, which I think was added probably a little bit later. But interestingly, this marks exactly where I found the Michael line, um, which kind of got me. As soon as I got there, I kind of found it. Um, and I'm, com I'm, pretty com I'm pretty convinced it is the Michael line, although uh, I'm happy for other people to go there and double check this and back it, back it up. I, I'm just a, I just did a basic bit of dowsing, really. Um, but I'm quite sensitive to the Michael and Mary lines after years of researching them. And under here, under the chin of the frog, the plumed serpent moves along the sort of length of the island, as we saw in this photo here. It kind of goes like that, and the Michael line here. And yeah, and you can see it goes right through here. I'm basically standing on the line here. But there, where they cross, underneath the chin of the frog, is where lots of offerings have been made, and apparently lots of seeds are placed there, and different grains and things like this to give it an offering to the sort of frog effigy. And I later found out that the frog e effigy means is a fertility symbol in some Inca traditions. So this kind of got me straight away that perhaps, again, it was like one of these ancient sacred sites where they place the seeds to then go and plant them and increase the yield and quality of their crop. Just This is just speculation at the moment, but. Um, I'm still researching this. Then this is the southern part of the island where the Mary energy line goes. And that's the island of the moon in the background. And basically it goes more or less through this doorway here, which I thought was quite interesting, and sort of uh, meanders along the coast slightly. As you can see, in this, it sort of goes along the coast there. And this area is where the, they cross as well. They kind of cross in this general area. And it's the same principle you get the way the Michael and Mary lines move through England. Uh, they kind of divide a few miles, then come back together and meet at node points, and then divide again, a bit like a caduceus moving through the landscape. And um, the whole idea of uh, there's lots of legends of the whole area. I mean, if you look into the Peruvian and Inca legends, there's a whole epoch before the Inca even appeared which talk about Viracocha and the Viracochans and Contiki Viracocha and how they came from the sea in the east on these boats. Or even some reports and some research say they came in golden, uh, golden metal, metallic objects flying through the sky, which I thought was quite interesting. And they brought the arts of agriculture and science and marriage and peace even to the people, the tribal peoples who were often warring and often involved in things such as sacrifice. And they brought, one of the key points that they brought agriculture and they brought the ability and uh, the sort of fertility technology with them from wherever they may have came. No one actually knows where these people came from and uh, so there's a whole story developing with that as well. And you get similar principles occurring in other parts of the world, similar, le similar legends. You get the Quetzalcoatl legends in Mexico, and you get exactly the same story associated with them. And also the Tuatha Dé Danann in Ireland, and the Osiris in Egypt, and many other such, um, hello, uh, <laughs> many other such stories. I'll just skip through that one. Oh, no, I shouldn't skip through that one. Yeah, actually. So, um, yeah, 
Okay, that's perfect, yeah. Okay, so this is just, um, we're just going to finish up here, I guess. Um, but I kind of wanted this talk just to be more of a speculative ideas kind of talk. I'm, I'm not coming to any grand conclusions here. But one of the things that interests me is that, and there's now proof that there was agriculture, because a lot of people felt there was just ancient agriculture going back 10,000 years in Sumeria and the whole Lebanon, that kind of region. But there's now proof that it was occurring where the Viracochans were supposed to have appeared. And again, no one knows who did it. So that all these legends that have been talked about over these many centuries and, and millennia have now have some clout. And there's proof of this from what this guy, guy here uh, talks about, um, that they were developing things in lots of different parts of the world around 10,000 years ago, which is when these legends are supposed to have been from, the Viracochans and Quetzalcoatls and other ones. So, with this is all kind of interesting information, but I really feel there is an application to this knowledge, to this science that has been rediscovered amazingly through the crop circles. That in, you know, the fact is these stone circles and megaliths and dolmens, etc., still work. They still function as a fertility generator, and they still can affect altered states of consciousness. And I don't know anything that's being built as a technology nowadays that's still going to be working in three to 5,000 years' time. Uh, I don't think my laptop will last, but you never know. But so I, I really saw, see this as a kind of compassionate thing that the ancients were doing. They weren't just doing it for themselves. They were doing it for their future generations to survive effectively. Because as the population grows, you really need to support that growing population somehow or other. There's been there's, there's lots of uh, research now that suggests there were famines, there were like real problems in prehistoric times, and people were dying out quickly because there simply wasn't enough food to go round. And so, with these kind of technologies, and as many of the tribes in North America have proven that where there's when they have a, a sort of earth mound or they have a dolmen or something similar in their tribe or society, they always are the richer tribe, the more wealthy, and, they, and then they sort of trade and become wealthier with all their abundant crops. And so it seems that the way that we put, we put a huge amount of energy and time and momentum into building sort of hydroelectric dams and nuclear power stations for electricity, the ancients were building these sites for the purposes of fertility. And I think that's where I'll end, so thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Francine, and everybody here. Um, I'm a bit of a last-minute addition, so um, I kind of feel special because of that, in, in some kind of way. And uh, I'm kind of following on from many other speakers who have uh, discussed their amazing research this weekend. And actually, the research I'm looking at stems from discoveries made from crop circles. And it's about, sto I call it Stone Age Survival and about earth energies and fertility and secrets of the stones. Oh. And um, first of all, though, I want to dedicate this to John Michel, who's um, a good friend of mine and also one of my biggest inspirations uh, for any of all this kind of research. And he died, actually, on St. George's Day this year. And uh, we dedicated our conference, Megalithomania, to him as well. 
Um, but I just want to read out this quote from his book, uh, The View Over Atlantis, which was his seminal book in the late 60s, because I feel it's a very, not only is, it, is a visionary idea at the time, no one had really thought of it like this, and it also sums up much of the research that I do nowadays to do with global ancient sites and earth energies. So a great scientific instrument lies sprawled over the entire surface of the globe. At some period, perhaps it was over 4,000 years ago, almost every corner of the world was visited by a group of men who came with a particular task to accomplish. With the help of some remarkable power by which they could cut and raise enormous blocks of stone, these men erected vast astronomical instruments, circles of erect pillars, pyramids, underground tunnels, cyclopean alignments, whose course from horizon to horizon was marked by stones, mounds, and earthworks. The vast scale of prehistoric engineering is not gen yet generally recognized. John Michel. So then words of John Michel kind of lead into some, some ideas that I've been developing to do with earth energies. And I've been researching this for, uh, I've been dedicated to researching this for two years now and looking at the fertility aspects of earth energies. Now, in fact, as well, and when they move slightly, or just often just the weight, the weight of a very heavy rock on top of another can cause a piezoelectrical effect. And these can build, and stones can build up charge and then release them at a certain time. And this is basically one of the fundamentals of um, uh, computers and watches. It's all, they're all uh, programmed and timed to release things at certain, uh, in certain sequences. So again, we think this technology may have been applied in ancient times with these sites. They were actually building up this charge through these different energies forming through the earth and manipulating it and then releasing it for various purposes. And you can see in this next photo that sometimes, this is actually in Brittany, that sometimes these stones are just mainly quartz. I mean, this one here is virtually pure quartz. And so are some of these. And this one here is another site quite nearby. And they're all placed in certain alignments and certain curves. And when you douse there, you can actually easily see that the earth energy is following these stones. And actually, th there's some connection there. This, again, is the, a chamber in New York State. This is a place called Kent Cliffs. This image here, you can see the orbs again, just inside the chamber. Now, technically, there's probably something like 200 of these chambers in New England, in the whole New England northeast area of America. And the archaeologists claim, and still claim, that they're colonial root cellars and they were just used to store vegetables uh, by the English and the Europeans who went there a few hundred years ago. However, some of the rocks they're using, these lintels, are up to 40 tons, and I can't imagine any family would be lugging 40 ton rocks around just to store their vegetables, but they stick by this, they really stick by this claim, and they, haven't, they won't change this, and it's, it's, it's quite, um, become, become quite detrimental to the sites themselves because some of these sites uh, are right next to roads and developers want to expand, expand the roads uh, and, and build you know, new businesses and housing estates and so forth. And these, these chambers get demolished because the archaeologists aren't sort of making it clear what they are. They're not researching it properly because carbon dating of many of these sites has dated these back to 4,000 years ago, miles away. So even in North America, in prehistoric times, they were lugging 90 ton stones around uh, and making these dolmens. Here, this is a photograph taken on the top of the uh, Lost World Pyramid in Tikal. It's one of the, the much older pyramids there. We have the two classic pyramids, uh, which everyone has seen, uh, with the sort of more pointy tops on them. But this one here is at least 800 years older than the famous ones there. And again, we, we get, in the mornings, you get all these different orb photography. Um, these orbs keep occurring. This photo here, this was taken at a rock chamber, again, in New York State. And you can see this plasma band that was photographed here by John Burke. Again, this was, again, first thing in the morning. This is the book they, um, they wrote, John Burke and Kaj Halberg, which looks at this science. So fundamentally, what we're really seeing here, what we're going to explore in this talk, is the idea that the ancients were working with a fertility technology but also that same energy that they're dealing with and, and they've been researching and uh, exploring 
is actually in increases altered states of consciousness within the human being and can have dramatic effects on various people. And, um, and you can see how well it affected um, Jeff and I in this next photo. And you can, you can see all these orbs occurring. And we're not sure, um, oh, oops a daisy. We're not sure where they came from because we weren't technically at a sacred site, but um, you never know. And here's my, this is when I visited Balance Rock in New York State. You can see this great orb here and a few others scattered around as well. And this is um, some research that was done and they found that these dolmens, especially they found this in North America and, and many other sites as well, that they're built upon a huge ma magnetic anomaly that's naturally within the land itself. They're built on a negative, it's a negative magnetic anomaly where the magnetic magnetism of that particular area drops dramatically. And that, they think, is what causes this electric charge. Because when magnetism drops, you often get electric charge. And, um, and this is what these orbs potentially are, according to these researchers. The other thing with these types of stone, if you're looking at quartz or granite rocks, we find that we have the piezoelectrical effect helping uncover much of an ancient megalithic science. And then hypothesis three, is this ancient technology being revealed for a reason? Perhaps in a post-2012 world, this knowledge may be essential as a survival tool, an awakener, and a direct contact with Gaia. Because these sites, as we'll see in this tour, these megalithic sites that we're going to look at are actually still working. They still work as a, as a device, uh, which is, could be very important in the coming years. So first of all, we really need to have a look at the, um, <coughs> the magnetic field of the planet before we get into Earth energies. Because the magnetic field is constantly at flux, it's constantly moving around. There's still debate exactly what causes it, although an iron-rich core is one suspect. But as we can see in this next slide, um, we can see that it kind of comes out through the North Pole and the South Pole and comes back round again into the center. And this beautiful crop circle is a very good representation of how it works. But these field lines, during the, uh, when the sun rises, the field lines in the morning increase in strength and tightness and they speed across the landscape and move through different geology in, in different ways, depending on actually the type of geology it's moving through, whether it may be a conductive uh, geology or less conductive geology. And often these, technically they're magnetic lines, often have high electric charge, depending on the media they move through. This just shows you the basic uh, the magnetic flow lines of the planet and just it shows you the basics of uh, how that functions. But when we, get, when we apply this kind of, these idea of these field lines, or sometimes they're called telluric lines, they're also just called lines of force, there's lots of different names for them. If they're applied to the ancient sites, we find lots and lots of uh, strange phenomena occurs. For instance here, this is um, a dolmen in New York State in a place called North Salem. It's a huge dome and it's 90 tons. Um, it's got four or five granite quartz blocks here. And you can see these orbs in the photo as well. And officially, um, on the sign, as you go there, it says it was a glacial erratic that landed there um, on these four blocks. Um, and actually, the, because it came from over 30... Originally, this research was done by the BLT research team in America. Uh, especially John Burke, who wrote the book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. And they came, up with this, they, they came up with this discovery when they went to look at where crop circles had appeared the year before. And they went back to the field a year later to see if any effects had appeared within the crops themselves. And often they noticed where, exactly where the crop circle had been the year before. The crop was now growing much quicker and faster and was, and was more abundant than the rest of the crop in the field. So there'd been some kind of effect that either the construction of the crop circle by the unknown makers of it had stimulated, i.e. an electromagnetic potentially energy, or the, the design itself had somehow altered the crop structure as well. So there's all these different ideas. But so that initially they thought, well, this is interesting because if a, just a crop circle in a field can increase the growth rate and yield of any type of crop, then this has potentials for use in agricultural um, farming technology. And, um, 
and it can actually be used as a kind of system of, of technology that's still in use today. So these are some ideas that I've, I've been developing. The first hypothesis is um, that crop circles have helped unlock the great mystery of earth energy, which we'll look, look at how that is the case as we go through this talk. Earth energy, I believe, through my research, was manipulated into energy lines to increase fertility in the landscape, animals, humans, and the crops themselves. Another hypothesis is that the magnetic and electrical effects, which are often what you get with, with the crop circles when they're formed, which is being discussed at this conference as well, that this is an ancient science and um, it was actually in use within the megalithic sites as well and not just in the crops, not just a crop circle technology. But it can, it, can, it can help you reach altered states of consciousness and also it's linked with the ability of shamanic traveling to other megalithic sites. And in some reports and some cases that I've, been, that I've found, there's even ideas about time traveling, that, that certain cha ancient megalithic chambers and stone circles are, uh, that people have reported with, but we'll, we'll look at that a bit later. So I'm wondering if crop circles share the same purpose and 